Uh, nothing more than bad timing on the arm thing, but it's <coughs> it'll be okay eventually. Uh, well, actually, um, early on here, uh, when uh, Dr. Uh, Turpin called me, uh, oh, last summer sometime, I guess, I think, if I recall, he said I might say a little something about what got me interested in entomology in the first place. You did say that I should say a little something about what got me interested because I don't want to spend too much time on that, but I think it's kind of an interesting story in its own, uh, in its own way. Uh, the short story, the short version is <coughs> my Aunt Margaret needed some help on an insect project and got me involved. And it snowballed into a career in entomology. The slightly longer version is I had just finished a grueling year of kindergarten <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not kidding, grueling. It was a one-room country school, same school my father attended when he was little, same exact teacher, and I think her patience had been running kind of thin about the time I got there because, uh, well, one of my first memories was if you misbehave in this class, you get your hand whacked with, I think it was a ruler, it was some kind of a stick, so here I am, a petrified, terrified little kindergartner, Finally, the year ended and it was summer vacation and one of the first things that uh, my mom said, well, she had been a school teacher also. Well, my Aunt Margaret was a school teacher in a similar school, different location, but she needed help because uh, she was attending a summer school and was taking a biology course. And my first thought was, poor Aunt Margaret, she has to go to school in the summer. I was so glad to get out of school. It was, uh, couldn't even explain it, but, uh, and so summer vacation, she needed help on an insect collection that she was putting together for a biology class she was taking to you know, something about her teaching certificate needed renewing, I guess. And so here I was, you know, six years old, just out of kindergarten, younger brother, younger sister. We'd gone to visit my Aunt Margaret on their farm. They, they, are, they were also farmers, you know, family farm. Just about everybody grew up on a family farm back then, I guess. And so her little kids, her, my cousins, same age as us, basically. There were four of them, but the youngest was in diapers, so that one didn't help with the collecting much. But she needed help collecting insects. She didn't have time. She was a farm wife. So was my mom, so was everybody else. If you know anything about farm wives, you know that's more than a full-time job. So, besides raising the kids, you're also milking the cows, feeding the hogs, feeding the chickens, gathering the eggs, and fixing meals. Well, plus she was a teacher. So she did not have time to run around with a butterfly net, no way. So she got the kids involved. So if you imagine, you imagine six little kids with one butterfly net chasing after anything that moved. That's what we did. And so we filled up a few jars with you know, whatever we could find. And a few I thought were quite, quite the prize. Things that I had collected were quite uh, interesting in my opinion. And so one of which was a particular butterfly that I had pursued for a while before I finally caught it. And so the time came to give these things to Aunt Margaret for her collection, but I really wanted to keep a few things that I thought were special that I had collected. Well, not, uh, not on that day. But my, my immediate thought though was as soon as I leave here, anything I catch is mine and can go into my own insect collection. So that was kind of the beginning of that. Um, well, my mom, as it turned out, was a 4-H leader. And uh, so she you know, explained that uh, you can take an insect collection to you know, the fair, be involved in entomology uh, through 4-H. You can be a young entomologist through the 4-H club. So, you also had to be 10 years old before you could join entomology. Well, I was six, had to wait four years before I was old enough to be in it, before I could be in the 4-H club. Well, eventually, you know, I had a, a fair size insect collection by the time I was old enough to finally uh, display things at the county fair. Well, I mean, I think the collection, you had to have at least 25, maybe 30 insects in your collection you know, for the first year uh, entomology project in 4-H. Well, I had about 300 by then. <laughs> the hard part was selecting which ones to put in my 4-H collection. Well, so, you know, my whole life has kind of been like that, you know, collecting too much or doing too much of one thing or another, but and then try to boil it down into a reasonable amount of time. So I'm gonna talk fast and try to you know, get all this in if I can before the time expires. Uh, the next, uh, so 4-H 4H, 4H entomology, and uh, first year in, I had the best collection in the county. Blue ribbon, purple ribbon, purple ribbon meant it was the 4-H. Uh, it was going to be the, the, the selection from the county for the state fair entry. Blue, so mine, you know, first time out, Mine was chosen for the state fair entry from our county. 
and blue ribbon at the state fair. So this is, you know, for a 10-year-old first year 4-H kid, this was really positive reinforcement. So uh, there I was, you know, off to a, a young entomology career. Well, so uh, any, you know, any spare time that I had, I'd be collecting insects on the farm. You see, this was 500 acres in northeast Iowa. Mostly corn and soybeans, you know, alfalfa, some pasture for the cows. We had dairy and beef also. Um, but there was a particular part of the farm that was undisturbed. Uh, it was too wet to do anything with, kind of a peat bog area in, in one corner of the farm. About five acres that had been undisturbed since the last glacier melted, you know, like 12,000 years before that or so. And so it was a nice area for a young entomologist to grow up collecting because there were some insects there that you couldn't find in a lot of other places apparently and so uh, and so my collection grew and uh, I guess the, the next interesting thing that happened was uh, partway through 4-H it was early high school junior no no it was more like freshman year of high school something like that that from from each county in Iowa uh, every year I think it was 10 uh, 4-H kids were selected to attend the state 4-H conference and that happened at Iowa State University and eventually my turn came. I was selected as one of the delegates from our county to attend this conference at Iowa State. And part of that conference was in the, you know, one afternoon you were allowed to select the department of your interest and you know, be introduced to somebody, talk to somebody in that department. Well, my choice, of course, entomology. And the first real entomologist that I actually met was Dr. Larry Pedigo. And it's nice that Dr. Turpin brought up Dr. Pedigo because I was going to bring him up too. Um, and so my first real entomologist, Dr. Larry Pedigo. Well, <clears throat> part of uh, okay, part of what uh, you know, growing up with you know insects in my you know, I, in my life, and you know, being just really focused on insects. All the kids in school knew that if there was anything they wanted to know about insects, that they'd find something. I was the person to ask. The, the teachers knew that. My grandmother knew that. If something was eating her, whatever it was in the garden, ask me. This is grade school. They were asking me about what to do about what. So I was kind of in a in a the early f version of extension entomology, way back then when I was you know still about that tall. Uh, and one of the uh, entomologists that I'd uh, you know, heard his voice, heard his name plenty of times, was a certain uh, Dr. Harold Gunderson. And that person for a long time was the state extension entomologist in Iowa. He had an office at the insectary building on the IS Iowa State campus, you know, just down the hall from Dr. Pettigo's office. And so uh, during that uh, visit to Iowa State, when I was, you know, back in high school with the 4-H uh, conference, I got to meet Dr. Gunderson. That was somebody Dr. Pettigo introduced me to. So, uh, anyway, so that was, uh, so, you know, well, extension entomology, you see, had kind of been in the back of my mind as a career for myself, you know, to, to, to be heading toward. Um, and I just really didn't know if that was ever an option. My dad always said that someday Dr. Gunderson's going to retire, there'll be a job opening there, and then I can apply for the state entomologist uh, extension job. So, well, it never quite happened. As it happened, uh, Dr. Gunderson uh, passed away. He died before I was uh, graduating from Iowa State. So somebody else got the job, but uh, I continued on. And, okay, well, next was Iowa State University, you know, undergraduate uh, position there. Uh, I had a... Uh, uh, work study uh, job part time with Dr. Pedigo, you know, assisting with some of the soybean insects he was studying. The uh, green clover worm in particular, so I raised a lot of green clover worms, uh, you know, helping with uh, counting you know, whatever. And so Dr. Pedigo, um, so then I finished, well, that's, I also met uh, Dr. Turpin at some point along in there too, and you know, just finished up Iowa State, and well then Dr. Uh, Pedigo, or Dr. Turpin there, I, I mentioned about the next step for me was Purdue, and so uh, I spent a few years here and you know, counted a lot of black cut worms and dug, dug up a few corn roots too in the process here and there and dug up a few wire worms too, I guess every now and then we'd have wire worms to count. And so uh, that was basically my education in entomology. And all this time and any, any chance I'd get, I'd be out collecting insects for my own insect collection too because I was I just never really lost interest in collecting and finding new insects that I hadn't seen before because just the, you know, simply the diversity of them just kept me interested. I never just never outgrew that, I guess. And so, uh, and so, <coughs> I'd finished up at uh, Purdue. Well, actually, I was I should say that one of the uh, fringe benefits of uh, 
my time at uh, <coughs> Purdue Entomology was meeting Marjorie, who's sitting in the corner over here. That's my wife. Uh, she uh, was a person that Dr. Turpin had hired as a lab technician on the project that we were doing. And we seemed to hit it off just fine. She was uh, raising the cutworms and I was experimenting with the cutworms. And anyway, so we got to know each other pretty well and it just it worked out very well there. And so we got married and have been, uh, how many years now? I don't know, 30 something, I guess. Um, Mm, I better figure that one out real quickly. <laughs> 37, is it 37 years? I don't know, it's something like, okay. And so, okay, then came the uh, Cincinnati Zoo. Well, I'd been looking for jobs, applying for jobs, looking at the uh, opportunities available in the ESA newsletter and well, a lot of research and development, ag chemical company type things. And then we saw the one about the Cincinnati Zoo, a position for an entomologist to raise insects, display insects in educational displays, occasional collecting trips to uh, tropical uh, locations. And she and I both thought, this is perfect. What are the chances I'll ever get that job? Well, has it happened? I, history proves I did get the job. Um, although there were a lot of applicants. And uh, part of what helped me get the job was you know, childhood interest in raising insects, collecting, keeping caterpillars, raising caterpillars, beetles, bugs, what have you, just as a hobby for so many years. That was uh, you know, strong in my, in my uh, favor. Also, photography. I had become interested in you know, close-up photography of insects. Had bought a second-handed Nikon uh, back when I was at Iowa State with a close-up lens on it. And I'd been doing insect photography for a number of years before I got to Purdue, kept doing it. I was photographing things for Dr. Turpin, you know, field, you know research plots and this and that uh, whenever necessary. So, and so, but just as a hobby, just as, you know, just photographing insects. Well, that worked out really well in the insect uh, in exhibit project at the Cincinnati Zoo. The other thing that helped a lot was my interest in woodworking and cabinetry. You know, this kind of goes along with collecting insects. You get a certain number and, and you run out of space. Your, your display case gets filled up, you need another display case. So I built another display case. So anyway, so uh, my cabinetry uh, stemmed from my insect collecting. I needed more room to put my insect collection in, more and more display cabinets, more and more display cases. And so, um, and then that just kind of branched out into other types of display areas. And that worked out very well at the Cincinnati Zoo too. And so <coughs> what I'll talk about then is the Insect World Cincinnati Zoo. And I began work there uh, in January 1977, during the coldest winter that they'd ever had in 100 years, I guess, and the most snow. And it was not a good time to be driving a U-Haul truck to Cincinnati. But we arrived and <coughs> started with uh, the, uh, the project. Well, so I was hired to be you know, the first entomologist on the project. I was hired before the exhibit was finished. In fact, it hadn't even begun yet. There was still you know, flags in the ground where the hole was going to be when I got there. And so um, the uh, Cincinnati Zoo, OK, now I want to go to there. <coughs> OK, when I arrived, my, my, my job was to kind of twofold. I was to be a consultant on the project and to begin a collection of live insects which could be transferred to the uh, insect exhibit when it was finished. So basically, I had a year and a half to get this together. The, the exhibit opened in August of 1978. So from January of 77 to August of 78 is when I spent my time you know, consulting with the design team. We had a professional design team, which you know, had designed a number of, the, of other insect exhibits around the country, and some rather nice ones, as it turned out. But they had never des you know, designed an insect exhibit before. Well, neither had I, so uh, we did the best we could. Um, but as it turned out, there were a sev uh, several things that uh, over the years I needed to redesign and rebuild because they just didn't work out as well as we'd hoped. Well, so when I, when I arrived, it was on the ground floor. And I use that literally because it was before there was a floor when there was actually dirt on the ground where the floor was going to be. So okay, so this is what it looked like in the summer of 1977, you know, several months after I got there, finally we had walls. No floor, no roof, but at least we had walls. The amusement park thing in the background has been gone for a long time. That's, that's been 
That was only there for a few years after the insect exhibit opened and they replaced that with something else. So the insect exhibit has been open since August of 1978. And during that time, we have about a million people per year go through the exhibit. The first few years, it was a little less than a million. Uh, and for every year after the first you know, three or four years, for every year after that, it's been a, mil a million, a million and a quarter, something like that, per year. It's been open uh, this summer. It'll be 35 years that the exhibit's been open, which means that we've had probably over 40 million people you know, visit the insect exhibit at the Cincinnati Zoo. 40 million, although many of those are repeat customers who have come you know, several times during the year. Some of them came as children. They've grown up. Now they're bringing their children. And I think we're getting close to the third generation where the grandchildren are now being shown the insect exhibit. So uh, it's been you know, long enough now to have met an awful lot of people and <coughs> forget an awful lot of names. So you enter the exhibit diversity. Well, we, we selected that to be our theme for a couple of reasons. One is that insects are a really diverse group of animals. And for another, that gives us a lot of uh, flexibility in what we display in here. With diversity as a theme, you can go you know, any direction you want to go. So we've designed the exhibit a lot like the chapters in an introductory entomology text. And actually, I was going to ask, I suppose a lot of you have seen the exhibit. Has anybody here who has not seen the insect exhibit in Cincinnati? Oh, good. Well, then some of this is new material for at least part of you. OK, so uh, arthropods, well, we start with something general. Now, I'd mentioned about the million visitors per year. Here we see a group of kids. Uh, part of that uh, uh, attendance is school ch uh, students of all different ages who come as a class trip, you know, usually during April and May. So if you plan to visit the zoo in Cincinnati, don't come during April or May <laughs> because there are kids everywhere and you just about can't get through the place. So about 130,000 kids each year come to see you know, the insect exhibit, the rest of the zoo too for that matter, but I think they all go through the insect house during April and May, 130,000. So here are a few that are taking the test. Is this an insect or is this a relative? And so there's a drawer underneath that identifies what it is. Okay, what is an insect? Well, so we've got the building laid out, like I said, as an introductory entomology text, You're starting with general things and highlighting this and that and the other. Here we have insects in motion, is what it says back behind these people. But I'm showing you this because of this particular, whoops, because of this particular thing down here. We, that's the identification railing. We call that the pinning rail. At any rate, um, it has information describing what's in the displays, what the photographs are, you know, supporting material for that particular section of the building. OK, another view, insects in motion. So uh, you know, f swimming, flying, <coughs> jumping, and crawling. Uh, we have live insects in the tanks, photographs, and then support material, some of it printed on the walls, some of it in the identification railing. So we've combined museum techniques with zoo techniques in this exhibit. OK, habitats and homes, well, we're talking about nests that they build, wasp nests, uh, termite nest up here, different kinds of things. Okay, the displays, <coughs> now in order to take care of these, now one of the reasons I think that insect exhibits had not been, uh, well, had not really been built in the past, or as uh, Tom mentioned was one of the first, well actually it, I think it was the first, you know, standalone, you know, self-contained insect exhibit anywhere in the world. A few other zoos in the world had displayed insects and were displaying them. There were a few in Germany. Uh, there was a British museum, I think, in London that had a few insect exhibits. Uh, and then, well, the Smithsonian had just opened, you know, one room in their Natural History Museum about six months before we opened where they display insects. But as far as a standalone self-contained insect exhibit, a couple of good reasons why I think people didn't do that was one was high maintenance and the other is insects don't live very long and you have to keep replacing them unless you're very good at getting them to reproduce in captivity, which was the top of our list of things to do was get them to reproduce in captivity any time we could as much as possible. So 
Here we are taking care of the displays. The small and medium sized displays can be removed from the wall, you know, slid out. The, the edge can rest on that identification railing and then you reach in you know, through the lid at the top for you know, cleaning and feeding. Okay, so aside from just looking at the displays, you know, occasionally we'd have a little insect demo. Sometimes within the insect exhibit itself, sometimes we would take insects to a school or to a Boy Scout, Girl Scout retirement home, what have you, um, and do a little insect demo. So that's me, that's me right there. A long time ago, there's a resemblance if you change the color of the hair a little. Showing these kids a Hercules beetle. That's the male Hercules beetle right there. Okay, hissing cockroaches. I'm sure you've all seen these, right? Don't you keep a colony of these here perhaps for insect demos? Perfect for insect demos, perfect for an insect exhibit. They you know, live relatively long, easy to rear. They're durable, just about unbreakable. So it's a very good thing to use in an insect exhibit. Uh, and so one thing that the, the director, that's Ed Maruska, I should, uh, Ed Maruska. Now this is the director of the Cincinnati Zoo at that time. He'd been director for a long time and I should say this was his pet project. He really wanted an insect exhibit. He had seen some of the exhibits in Europe, you know, reptile house, aquarium that, that, that had insects on display and he really wanted to do an insect exhibit because, you know, he was especially interested in, in them. And so, uh, <coughs> although one of the things, I think he was joking when he said it, uh, but I'm not sure. Uh, he said, if this exhibit fails, at least we can have the world's largest cockroach exhibit. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the message to me at that time was don't let that happen. So <clears throat> I've tried very hard to, you know, not turn this into, well, we did have, uh, well, we still do, we have several species of cockroaches on display for one reason or another. They're interesting in one way or another, but uh, only a few. We have a lot of other species, and I want to talk about a few of the other things and why we display them and some of the problems we ran into. Early on, you know, early in the design of all this, honeybees was top of the list. We had to have a honeybee display. You just can't have an insect exhibit if you don't have a honeybee display. I mean, they're so important in pollination and, and their behavior is so interested in, uh, interesting with the uh, communication and all that goes on that we got to have honeybees. So the question was, uh, have I had any experience with honeybees? And to be honest, no, I hadn't, other than collecting a few from my insect collection and other than what I learned in the introductory entomology course I took at Iowa State. That's, that's as far as beekeeping, nothing. I'd seen a bee swarm a time or two, you know, swarm of bees, but uh, nothing about beekeeping. Well, we did have a local beekeeper involved in the project, and he apparently didn't know anything about uh, display hives for honeybees either. And so uh, <clears throat> this is what we came up with. This is the original honeybee display uh, right here, and the big difference is this red column on the side went all the way to the top, uh, and the glass, you know, glass on both sides. Well, I pretty well knew you needed to have glass on both sides and bees in the middle, but that's pretty well, uh, that's pretty much the extent of my knowledge there. Bees in the middle, glass on both sides. Well, the design team that came up with this, and if I'd known any more about this, I would have said don't do it this way at the beginning, but the only way to get those frames out is through the wall. Slide them horizontally through the wall on the left right there. And anybody that's ever taken apart a beehive knows you can't do that after bees have been in there for more than about a week because they've got propolis all over, everything's glued together, not to mention you smash half the bees trying to slide them out endwise through the wall. Well, okay, so this was a complete disaster. <clears throat> and one of my first assignments was come up with a better design than this. So, whoops, this button. This is what I came up with. An, origi an original bushing design here. The only part of the old hive that I kept was the red column. I saw that off at this level right here. And the only other thing I kept was the glass on the front and the back. So uh, what I've done then was to uh, build it in a, in a way where the, the black portion here, oh, the top, that column back there, and the bottom is connected to the wall, permanently attached connected to the red column, which is permanently attached. Whoops. 
And <coughs> this column on the right, wait a second, okay. The column on the right, right here, the, 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 the frame on the right is removable. So you can take that off and then the portion containing the, the bees, you know, those five frames vertically right there, are built into a self-contained unit which holds the glass, has a frame around it, uh, like a sub-frame you might say, holds the glass and the bees and you can slide it out of the framework that holds it. There's a hole at the bottom, kind of in front of where the little girl is standing. There's a hole that coincides with the uh, hole in the bottom that runs through the wall. And that part right there goes through this display wall, through a small service area space, and through an outdoor wall. The bees can exit to the outside for foraging. But the, the biggest improvement, of course, was being able to take the hive unit completely out around the outside of the building, through the door there out the back, and then you could take out some screws, take out some strips of wood, and then remove the glass on this side or remove the glass on the other side, you know, one or the other, to clean the glass. You know, after the bees have been in the hive for a while, you've got burr comb all over, you've got a little bit of propolis spread across the glass and that needs to be cleaned. And you need to put a red spot on the queen. Well, you don't need to, but it really helps with visitors who are trying to find the queen bee. And right beside this display is a photograph of a group of bees with a queen in the middle with a red spot on her back. So uh, we tried to keep things consistent and always have the queen marked with a red dot on the top of her thorax. So, something other, okay, besides honeybees, uh, Mr. Maruska, Ed, uh, Ed Maruska really wanted to have leaf cutting ants. Well, I'd never heard of leaf cutting ants, to be honest, until I got to Cincinnati. But it turns out they're really very interesting and that was one of the things on the list. We're going to have leaf cutting ants one way or the other. So uh, in, in, uh, it was fortunate though uh, that there was someone that we could consult with on how to raise leaf cutting ants and how to keep them in captivity. It was a Dr. Neil Weber who had been studying leaf cutting ants for most of his career apparently and had written a book entitled The Gardening Ants, you know, The Attines. It was published I think 1972. 71, something like that. Um, and uh, Ed Maruska had a copy of that. He said, read this, learn about leaf cutting ants. He also had a couple of colonies in the service area uh, of the aquarium. We were behind the scenes at the aquarium for th that first year and a half before the insect house opened. And, and uh, it set up in a, in, a, in a research sort of a arrangement where uh, the, the fungus gardens were contained in plastic boxes, okay? They were contained in plastic boxes. Now we've got leaf cutting ants. You, know, you can see how they got their name, leaf cutting ants, carrying columns and carrying pieces of leaves. They were set up in plastic boxes on a shelf, you know, very schematic. Uh, so I was thinking all along of how to display them in a more interesting way, in a more natural way. Uh, but I did want to say a little something about collecting leaf cutting ants. Uh, back when we first started, very few other institutions displayed insects. There's a couple in Germany, one in England, and you know, the Smithsonian had a few things, but you know, they were just getting started, we were just getting started. So no place else to really go for uh, you know, obtaining specimens other than head for the jungle with a butterfly net, with a shovel, with whatever it takes, and bring something back with you. To get leaf cutting ants, now this is uh, a trip, we brought back some leaf cutting ants. What you look for is a, a ant hill, a tall narrow thing right here needs to be a small anthill. If you try to collect a large colony of leaf cutting ants, <coughs> first thing you see is thousands of soldiers coming out of there. Large ants that really bite uh, severely, like mandibles are like little razor blades, and you, you don't even try to dig into a large colony. There's, you're, you're not going to get anywhere, and you'd never find the queen anyhow, even if you did dig into it. So you look for a small colony, a little anthill like this, just a few inches tall, and then under that, you carefully dig a hole beside it, you know, with your shovel, and then you go into the side of that hole that you first dug with a smaller instrument. Here it's a teaspoon. You go into the side with a teaspoon, carefully take away the soil until you uncover the fungus garden, which is this in the middle. And if it's a young colony, there will only be one fungus garden with a queen leaf cutting ant, you know, sitting you know, on the side of it somewhere. And you know you're good when you see the queen. Now, how do you identify the queen? 
no problem. <laughs> She's about a hundred times bigger than anything else in there, so you know you got the queen. And if you don't have the queen, you've wasted your time because that colony is going to die in a few weeks. Well, maybe a few months, but it's not going to survive. So you've got to have the queen. The good thing about leaf cutting ants is the queen lives a long time, maybe 15 to 20 years. Uh, and I think the longest we had one live was 16 years you know, in a uh, display situation, which may be a little bit stressful for them. I'm, I'm sure it is a, a bit stressful, trying to keep the humidity just right. And the, uh, well, anyway, so the queen leaf cutting ant. Um, now I wanted to say, I was starting to say a little about the, uh, the, the, the design of a leaf cutting ant colony and the plastic boxes. This is the original design right here. Uh, a series of plastic boxes connected by plastic tubes. Well, that's how Dr. Weber kept his leaf cutting ants. And this is just a, 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 an arrangement of that just stood up vertically instead of you know, horizontally on a, on a table. It's raised up vertically. Uh, underground uh, nesting area on the left, the foraging area, above ground area here on the right, where we'd put the leaf cuttings, you know, branches uh, of all sorts of different kinds for the leaves and for the ants to come out, cut leaves, carry them back to the nest. Well, after a few years of looking at that and thinking that just looks so artificial, I, I really wanted to do something more interesting than that and make it look more natural. Um, I came up with a better idea and uh, Ed Maruska's comment was, do it. So that's typically what his comment was, you know, the bottom line, do it. You know, if it seems like a better idea, do it. So I had a lot of flexibility, you see. Um, and so a lot of what we came up with was, you know, fairly innovative, I think. Uh, new designs for this and that and the other thing. We didn't have a lot of other institutions to consult with. We were, you know, kind of making it up as we went along in a lot of, a lot of cases. And so what I did was came up with a better design, I think. It's actually work, worked out rather well. Uh, this is the garden area on the left, you know, that left-hand side there, but instead of plastic boxes with plastic tubes, I wanted to make something that looked more like soil. But you need something hard that the ants can't you know, dig through. So I chose a certain kind of plaster. It's similar to plaster of Paris, only it's harder. It's, it's called hydrostone. You mix a little sand with that, put some mortar color with it, and you end up with something that looks like subsoil of tan color. It's as hard as concrete. The ants can't chew through it. And so it's a little time consuming to build it though. What I've got here then is a plywood uh, affair with the uh, chambers where the chambers go are completely cut through. That's all the way through where the tunnels are, are part way through the plywood. First I painted it with a penetrating epoxy to seal it so that it wouldn't decay. And what I'm doing here, you can see some areas off on the left areas, some openings that I've got lined with that hydrostone plaster substance. Put a few rocks in there to make it interesting. And then the tunnels, I've got uh, hydrostone in there. I used modeling clay. See, this stuff is, is rather liquid when you first mix it. So you need to have a form to pour it into. So I used modeling clay to create a form and then mixed and, and then poured the hydrostone into this uh, space around that clay, which is going to be the actual tunnel when this is all finished. And then when it was done, you put a piece of uh, plastic across it. I used polycarbonate, which is similar to plexiglass, only less likely to crack. Polycarbonate. Uh, that's also what they make bulletproof glass out of, only it's a lot thicker. So this is an eighth of an inch thick polycarbonate that I covered it with. And this is the final display after it was finished. That area to the left where it used to be, plastic boxes connect, connected by plastic tubes and everything was square and every angle was a 90 degree angle. I've tried to make it a little more natural looking like it's cut away into a hillside. And what we've got now, and that's me also uh, quite a few years ago. <coughs> what we've got now, the, which I don't have a photograph of, is the improvement upon this. Uh, in this area, up in the corner of the foraging area, I put a hole. This has been about maybe five or six years ago, uh, one of the projects I did for the zoo after I uh, retired from there. And it's not exactly retirement, it's more like self-employment. So just to be clear, I'm not retired, I'm just self-employed. <coughs> I built a uh, 
long series of tubes, maybe 50 feet long or so, that begin here, run across the ceiling, down the hall and around the corner and into another display area, which is where the foraging area now is located for the leaf cutting ant colony. So now you're not just feeding them right next door to where their nest is, you're feeding them about 50 feet away. So now you can see the column of ants carrying the pieces of leaves. A way more natural situation than what we've got even here. So, <clears throat> okay, time to pick up the pace. Uh, collecting trips, well I'd mentioned about collecting leaf cutting ants, you head to the jungle with a shovel. Well, part of the time we'd be looking for beetles and butterflies and other things. We went several different times. That's me right there in Ecuador in front of a buttress tree uh, holding my butterfly net. It's made of dark material so I'm not uh, frightening away. That was my idea there. Try not to frighten away the butterflies before I get even close. Uh, so we're collecting uh, insects and this is maybe once a year or so. Uh, and maybe uh, 10 days, you know, week and a half to two weeks, something like that. Uh, head for most often Central America or South America or West Indies. And most often the West Indies would be Trinidad, just off the coast of Venezuela. And the big advantage there is they speak English. <laughs> so Spanish, uh, I don't go with Spanish. English is the language uh, that I'm most <sighs> familiar with. So Trinidad I went to uh, quite a few times. One time to Southeast Asia, uh, Singapore, Malaysia. But uh, the light trap, okay? If you know, well you probably all know what an insect survey trap looks like. A metal uh, affair with the ultraviolet light in the top. I used one of those uh, when I was part of Dr. Turpin's uh, project collecting black cutworm moths and following their uh, population fluctuations during the summer. Well, so I came up with an idea how to make a light trap that I could pack into a suitcase and take on a collecting trip. So this is uh, what I came up with. Uh, plastic fins up at the top. That's, uh, you got the light bulb in the center there. So you got plastic fins, plexiglass fins. I needed a, some kind of a funnel. So the only plastic, it could have been transparent, I didn't have any, so I had uh, something called Kydex, which is what this is. It's plastic, it's flexible, you can bend it into a cylinder and pack it into a suitcase. Take everything apart, fold it up, and take it with you when you go somewhere. Here it's hung on the edge of a cabin that we were staying at, overlooking uh, a valley in the northern uh, range of mountains in Trinidad. So this is Trinidad. And so collecting trips. Well, we didn't only look for insects. Someone had said, you really ought to see what's going on over on that east coast of Trinidad this time of the year. The leatherback sea turtles are nesting. So we occasionally went and did something that was not entomology related. There, there I am photographing the leatherback sea turtle. And the person photographing me in this picture is Tom Myers, who I believe is on the schedule to be here in about a month from now. So when you see Tom, tell him I said hi. And then back to Cincinnati, this is, uh, I'm standing in the butterfly display at the Cincinnati Zoo's insect exhibit. Well, that was one of the things, you can't have an insect exhibit if you don't have a butterfly display. Or that was Ed Maruska's uh, feeling on the subject. So we have a butterfly display and then you need to have butterflies for it. Well, after uh, researching butterflies just a little bit, it was pretty clear the one to go with is the uh, Heliconius. Uh, genus. They live a long time, way longer than your average butterfly. So money well spent. Good investment uh, if you go with the Heliconius butterflies. This is the zebra butterfly which you see in Florida you know, around the Gulf Coast. They're also called passion flower butterflies because the larvae feed on the leaves of passion flower plants. Okay, the life cycle roughly then here's a pair of uh, zebras, male and female. Here's the female uh, ovipositing on the tips of a passion flower vine. The yellow spots there are the eggs. In about a week or so, five days or a week, the eggs hatch. Uh, and then you need to rear the larvae on passion flower. Well, here are two different species of passion flowers. I mean, there's a couple dozen species or more, but uh, uh, these are two of the more useful species that we found. Uh, some of the Heliconius butterflies are quite specific and only feed on one species of passion flower. Uh, others are a little more generalized and as time went by we selected for the more generalized species of 
passion flower butterflies. Two different kinds of passion flowers there. This is the larva of that zebra butterfly. In about three weeks, it'll pupate. This is the pupa right here. And in about a week or 10 days, the adult butterfly emerges. And so this is the adult zebra butterfly again. Uh, now, besides the passion flower plants for the larvae to feed on, you need something for the adult butterflies to feed on. Uh, the reason that they'll live longer than your average butterfly, you know, most butterflies might live for three or four weeks, and that's the end of their life. The passion flower butterflies can live for three or four months. So it's much longer, maybe five or six months if, if, if things go well, but three or four months at least. And the reason for that is they're not only feeding on nectar, they're also feeding on pollen. So you need a nectar and pollen source for the butterflies. Here's one sitting on a particular plant. It's an anguria related to, uh, the, it's a cucurbit related to watermelons. The fruit actually looks, look, the fruit looks like a tiny watermelon. The fruit of this anguria plant looks like a tiny, about two inches long, a watermelon. But it's a very good source of nectar and pollen. If you look at the tongue on this butterfly, the yellow substance there is pollen that the butterfly has collected from visiting flowers. And it can digest that pollen, get some amino acids out of it, get some protein out of it, and help this uh, butterfly live for much longer than most butterflies, three or four months. Now, on cloudy days, flowers don't produce a lot of nectar. So we have artificial flowers. This is a scrubbing sponge in a, in a small cup. Uh, the actual liquid, uh, a lot of butterfly displays use sugar water. Uh, as it happens, in our butterfly display, we also display hummingbirds. And the hummingbirds, you know, in captivity, need a you know, some high protein, or well, higher protein than sugar water if you want your hummingbirds to do well for any length of time. So there's a, a particular diet that's available commercially designed for feeding hummingbirds in captivity. That's what I've put in these uh, feeding dishes here. It's a hummingbird diet, so it's better than your average sugar water. It's got some protein, some vitamins, some amino acids. It's, it's a quite a good mixture uh, for the butterflies to feed on too. So a few butterflies that we displayed. These are a few other species of Heliconius. This is one from Costa Rica. Here's same species, different subspecies. This one comes from Ecuador. Same species, different subspecies. This one is from Trinidad. They're Heliconius erato. We've got several species here then from Trinidad. Here's Melpomne. That one came from Costa Rica. This is Sara. That's Heliconius Sara. That one came from Ecuador. That's Isabella. That's Heliconius Isabella. That one uh, came also from Trinidad, if I recall. Now, besides the Heliconius, we've tried a few other things. Heliconius definitely worked the best. Uh, but here's one from uh, Costa Rica. My wife Marjorie and I went to Costa Rica some years back. This is 1979, if I recall. Uh, it was the first time that we went to Costa Rica. And uh, <coughs> we visited uh, several places there. One of the, uh, her brother actually was living in Costa Rica at the time. We visited him. And behind where he was living, it was kind of a subsistence level combination farm ranch, you might say. And behind where he was living was a, a little grove of banana trees you know, before the forest began. And in the banana grove, owl butterflies. That's what this is, an owl butterfly. I collected a number of those, brought them back. Among them were females. I released them in the butterfly display at the Cincinnati Zoo and they laid eggs on the banana trees. We had only two banana trees in our butterfly display at the time. These are a, a group of larvae. They stayed together in a group for the first uh, three instars. After that, they split up and became solitary. But uh, as they got larger, they ate, uh, of course, they ate a lot more. And by the time they were finished growing, well, we had more than just this one group. There were several groups of caterpillars like this on these two banana trees. And they were not very big banana trees. They were just moderate size. Well, this group of caterpillars, along, well, it was about 50, I would say it was about 40, maybe 50 caterpillars total, defoliated, completely stripped the two banana trees that we had. Nothing left but stalks. But we finally had a nice generation of adult owl butterflies that emerged. This is the underside. You can see how they got the name owl butterfly because of the spots on the underside of the wing. 
problem with displaying these is they're only active or, or primarily active in the evening and the morning. You know, the crepuscular kind of behavior. And so not much of a display when your display is open during you know, the middle of the day. Not open that early and not open that late. The visitors come during the brighter daylight hours when these things are sitting quietly on the tree trunks and uh, is not active. So we only raised these for one generation. Did not see the point in continuing with them. Now something that we did uh, collect, uh, this, these came from Trinidad, uh, were the Hercules beetles. That's the male on the right with the long horn, the female a little higher up with no horn. Uh, that's Dynasties Hercules. Well I knew a little about a native species of Dynasties, that's Dynasties titius, the unicorn beetle that ranges as far north as here, more common farther south and farther east. But knowing a little about that, I knew that the larvae lived in rotten wood. So, come up with rotten wood. Uh, Mr. Moruska really wanted to raise Hercules beetles in captivity, so I thought, well, I'll do the best I can. Got some rotten wood. What was growing in the backyard behind the house where we lived in Cincinnati were some black locust trees. A couple of them had died, the inside was rotten. So this is locust, that's black locust that had rotted. And compost. Marjorie likes to do gardening. We had a compost pile in the backyard. So I mixed compost and black locust, came up with a combination of this. And put two or three of the female Hercules beetles in here and that was enough to do it. You know, the, I actually had success the first time I tried. So this was quite encouraging. Females laid eggs. And this is what we see. About a month later, it took the eggs about a month to hatch, we see Hercules beetle eggs along with some larvae that have just hatched just within the last you know, 24 hours probably from those eggs. And you see the scale at the bottom, that's symmetric down there. So these are, you know, the eggs are only half a millimeter, or well, half a centimeter long. The larvae are about one centimeter long. So the larvae you know, fed on decayed wood on that, uh, you know, the, the rotted locust that I'd provided. And about every two months, I'd go through these tanks. You know, these were set up in 10 gallon tanks. And I'd go through the tanks, sort very carefully through and see what was going on. And uh, on one occasion here, I found one that had just molted. That's a larva, the shed skin here is uh, off to the right. And that's uh, the, lar the larval head, it's still white. So it has just molted. The head darkens after about an hour. So, uh, well, you can see the shed skin is whizzing. It's just on its way out. Here we have a group. And this, I, I have to tell you honestly, is entirely too many. There's no way we can possibly feed this many Hercules larvae. So uh, some of these we you know, exchanged with other zoos, other museums, in exchange for other things that they had that we didn't have. So you can you know, trade insects back and forth uh, among other institutions. So by the time we were doing Hercules beetles, there were a number of other exhibits around the country that had some insect exhibits uh, going on. So, so we had a few other people we could trade with uh, by that time. Hercules beetle larvae of several sizes and ages. Uh, about midway through their development, we'd put them at maybe a dozen or so in each tank, you no know, 10 gallon glass tanks with uh, compost and decayed wood. And this is how big they got. Uh, it's about 100 grams is the weight, about the size of a hot dog, bratwurst, something <laughs> like that. Imagine a bratwurst with a head on one end and this is what you've got. A mature Hercules larva, third instar, they only have three instars, but that third instar takes a year. Now I kept track of some times and some weights, so you know, one of these generations we raised them for about 20 years, so we had a lot of work, you know, you know a lot of time to work with, uh, but successfully year, generation after generation for about 20 years. And so briefly, briefly, what we've got, the egg takes about a month to hatch, First in star larva, about one month. It's still only about five grams. This is the weight in grams over here. Second in star larva, about two months. You get up to about 20 grams. Third in star larva takes a year. And you get up to, uh, oh here it's 80 grams. Uh, this was an average. The largest one was I think 105 grams. But on the average, well so males are gonna be larger, females are gonna be smaller. Uh, Pupation, the weight drops off during the, you know, at pupation. Pupa takes about two months and then the adult emerges. The weight drops uh, significantly there. You're getting back down to in the 30 to 40 gram uh, area on the adult weight. 
and the adult lives for about six months or so. Or more than six months. If you take good care of it, you might get eight, ten months out of it. So, Hercules beetle. Okay, a little bit more about the life cycle. The larva, when it's ready to pupate, makes a cocoon in, in the soil, in the compost, or in the decayed wood. It'll make a cocoon, and it'll line that uh, cavity with uh, some sort of secretion that hardens it. And you end up with basically a cocoon, you know, pupation cell. Now this thing is almost like a football, okay, not quite as big as a football. In there would be a male. The female pupation uh, chamber is a lot smaller because she doesn't have to accommodate the horns. Remember the long horns on the male? Okay, you crack that open, this is what you begin to see. Okay, at the top end there, you can see the horns. That's why the pupation chamber is so much longer, is to accommodate the horns. Okay, here's the adult, uh, here's the, 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 the male pupa on its back. You can see the whole thing and you can see why it's so much longer. Okay, and then after two months or so, the adults emerge. And here I am holding one of the adult male Hercules beetles. Okay, so that was one of our success stories was the Hercules beetles. And as I say, we raised those for about 20 years. And finally decided that a year and a half in the developmental stages was a little bit too much. Uh, also, the other thing that uh, influenced uh, discontinuing that colony was that other species became available commercially from a supplier in Southeast Asia where you could, you know, just send him some money, he'll send you the beetles, you don't have to deal with the larvae. So we quit raising Hercules beetles, but we did it voluntarily. It wasn't because the colony died accidentally. It was a, it was a decision that we made. Now these are Goliath beetles. They come from Ghana or Western Africa. Various species of Goliath beetles live in you know, tropical Africa, but this particular species is Goliathus regius, the female on the left, the male on the right. We tried as best we could to raise these while well, using similar techniques, but the best we could do was beetles that were about half this size. You know, the larvae didn't, it seemed as though they needed something else besides rotten wood. Um, or maybe a different species of rotten wood, uh, we don't know. But uh, with some difficulty we raised a generation of Goliath beetles and then we couldn't get them to mate in captivity. so. That culture ended uh, with just one generation produced. The uh, harlequin beetle, now we've, we've tried a few different kinds of beetles. This is a harlequin beetle. You find those in Central and South America. We raised these a generation in captivity, um, although with cerambicids you need tree trunks of some sort, either live or dead, depending on what species they are. And, uh, these we found uh, fed on a particular tree uh, or, or pr pr uh, pr primarily found in certain trees related to mulberry trees. The, the most similar thing we had you know, growing in Cincinnati was the mulberry tree. So we cut chunks of mulberry tree and put some female beetles in there and they laid eggs. We had larvae uh, living under the bark in the, in the mulberry tree trunk sections that we had. and We raised a generation of these with a lot of space occupied and uh, it took a lot of time. It was a year, more than a year, I think, to raise a, a generation of harlequin beetles. And there too, we decided this was too much trouble, so we discontinued that idea. Uh, other species besides beetles, and I've talked about some <laughs> bees and ants and beetles, mostly butterflies, but we've, we've got a, quite a lot of other things. And the hard part in, in putting this talk together was what? to include and what I would have to leave out. I left out an awful lot of things. Over the years, we've worked with probably 200 species, maybe more than that, and I've you know, pruned it down to maybe uh, you know, a couple dozen or so that I'm talking about right now. One of these that was rather interesting, I thought, is uh, this uh, assassin bug right here. Red spots, here's another one similar to it, white spots. Those both come from Africa. They're about the size of a wheel bug, if you know what that is, inch and a half long or so. And uh, quite venomous, it turns out. Uh, somewhere along the line, I met the person who 
had been spending years studying these in Africa. This guy visited the Cincinnati Zoo and introduced himself and says, by the way, do you know what kind of venom these things have? And no, I didn't. He says, as it turns out, it's similar to cobra venom. <laughs> so this explains why it hurts so much to get bit by one, I guess. I personally never got bit, but one of the people who works with me did, and he says, it was like a bolt of lightning that went up his arm. He says, don't get bit by these. So from there on out, we were really, really careful to not get bitten. But these are one that are very easy to rear in captivity. And that's something we were looking for. Large, interesting markings, an interesting story that goes with it. Uh, a good example of a you know, hemipteran, for example. A uh, good example of a regivide. Uh, but in captivity, you can raise them by just adding crickets, just house crickets to the colony. As long as you keep putting crickets into the cage, you can keep raising these generation after generation. They tend even not to prey upon their own nymphs. You know, some predators will eat their own nymphs if given a chance. These tend not to do that. So it's an excellent species, quite easy to rear in captivity. But you want to be a little careful when you reach in and you're cleaning the glass. <laughs> so <laughs> You might want to be wearing long gloves just to, well, actually it's better not to because they, they're, they're actually not aggressive. You know, they'll, they'll run across your hand. They don't bite. They only bite you if you get one pinched. So, this, you know, it's like handling a velvet ant or a, you know, whatever. You, you don't get injured unless you're confining it uh, in your hand. So, other hemipterans, well, I've talked about a lot of terrestrial things. Aquatics were part of the plan. We gotta have some aquatic insects in this. And so we have some uh, bellistomatids here. This is a abetus, is the genus. It's one of these where the females lay eggs on the male's back. And these are also quite easy to rear in captivity. Although you do need to separate out the nymphs when they hatch because the adults will mistake them for prey and eat them as quickly as they can. So you want to be you know, netting hatchlings out of your display every day, transferring them into a tank for rearing and keeping them, you know, along with uh, <coughs> others of a similar size, and you'll be fine. But to feed these, crickets are a good choice. The problem with, you can't be dropping live crickets in there because they hit the water, they float to the edge and crawl up the side of your tank, and they're out of here. So you freeze them first. As long as the crickets have been killed and freezing them is very good, drop them on the water, they thaw out rather quickly, and the, you know, the water bugs will feed on dead crickets just as well as live crickets. So you can rear these for generation after generation. And we've kept these going for about 35 years now. 34, <coughs> year, 34 years, something like that, in continuous culture year after year for the last 34 and a half years. Okay, here's one. Okay, walking sticks. I've always been kind of fond of walking sticks, to be honest. Uh, this is one from Malaysia. Uh, the eggs take about six months to hatch. The problem with raising this, I never did find out what it feeds on in Malaysia. But in captivity, it'll eat oak. But not any oak, it needs to be one of the white oak relatives, the rounded leafed oaks, you know, white oak, burr oak, uh, water oak. Anyway, one of the white oak. It'll feed on certain live oaks also. <coughs> and so we kept live oaks in a greenhouse same greenhouse that we were growing passion flowers in uh, you know, at the zoo in Cincinnati, a greenhouse that we had uh, for us to use. We'd keep in a half a whiskey barrel an oak tree that would stand, you know, eight, ten feet tall. We had to have you know, a dozen or so of those because one isn't going to last all winter. <clears throat> Not when you've got walking sticks this big that are eating it. So, that one from Malaysia, this is a leaf insect, a nymph that has just hatched. These are found in Java, a leaf and insect. What about the eggs? What about the eggs? Oh, point out the eggs. Well, yes. Egg. Well, I was looking at the eggs, but I thought everybody else knows what these are, but maybe not. The uh, seed-like structures are the eggs. Those take about five months to hatch in this case. Here's a newly hatched nymph. When they first hatch, they're this orange, kind of orangish color. In about a week, you know, after they've been feeding on you know, vegetation, they'll turn green. Uh, about a week later, that's before they molt. It's just a gradual color change during that first instar. They'll turn green. This is a nymph about half grown. It's called the Javanese leaf insect. Philium is the genus. Easy to see why they called it that. 
Here we have a pair of them. <coughs> the larger one that looks like the leaf is the female. The thin one that's standing on top of that one is the male. <coughs> so the Javanese leaf insect. In nature, I understood they feed on guava, the leaves of a tree called guava in captivity. They also will eat oak. But same kind of oak, it's got to be the white oak type, rounded leafed, or the, ever, or, or the uh, live oak types. Uh, so that's another good reason to keep some oaks in your greenhouse during the winter. During the summer, we walk around the zoo with a pole pruner and cut branches off of the appropriate trees, stick the branch in a bucket of water, and come back to the insect house. That was part of the daily routine. Take a walk, take a few cuttings, come back to the insect house, do some leaf changes. Okay, another walking stick. This one, Malaysia. Um, an especially nice one, Farnassia, I think is the genus on that one. Here the eggs only take about two months to hatch. Here's another one though that you need to be raising oak if you want to keep this one in captivity. If it's not summertime at least, if you want to keep it in the winter, you got to have oak. Here's one that's a little more general in what it eats, uh, also from Malaysia. That's Heteropteryx is the genus on that. The problem with raising these though, at least for that first generation, is that the eggs take about a year to hatch for a whole year. The adults live rather long though, you know, six months, eight months in the adult stage, but that problem with the eggs, you know, incubating for a year at, at the beginning, that was uh, kind of an issue. But as time went by and we got the generation spread out a little more, eventually we ended up with continuous overlapping generations. And in all of these cases, that's what we were aiming for, continuous overlapping generations, no matter what it was. It just took us a little longer to get there with some species than it did with others. Okay, here's another one. This is from New Guinea. About the same size as the previous one. It would cover the palm of your hand. That's the female. Oops, wrong button. Okay, that's the female on the right. The male down here on the left. And these are a little more diverse in their food plant preferences. They're sitting on something called leatherleaf viburnum. The nice thing about that, it's evergreen. Leaves are on all year. In the winter, just knock off the snow, take some cuttings, put it in water and you're fine. The one previous would feed on, uh, the previous one there, would feed on pyracantha, which is also called fire thorn. It's a shrub used for hedges. Disadvantage is the thorns, so you've got to be a little careful how you handle it, but it's another evergreen plant. And in the winter, knock off the snow, cut some pyracantha, bring it in, and you can feed these all year round. Okay, now that male I was just showing you, uh, if you're careful about it, you can use this in an insect demo, show it to someone else, but you do have to be careful. Uh, if you notice on the hind femur, that spine right there, they use that for a weapon. And if it's disturbed or handled the wrong way, it'll tip its rear end up and lash out with the hind legs using that spine as a weapon. So not quite as good for a demonstration insect. Insect demo is not as good. This particular one here, much better. The Australian walking stick. Uh, uh, comes from Queensland, Northern Australia. Ecstatosoma is the genus. Uh, also feeds on pyracantha in captivity. In Australia, feeds on eucalyptus. Hard to keep up with the eucalyptus in Cincinnati. It was so convenient for us. I was so happy that it ate pyracantha when we got these. And we've been keeping these, well, several of these now. We've been keeping in continuous culture for, you know, 30, 25, 30 years, something like that. So, uh, but not all of them, just some of them. Uh, well, I like the, the New Guinea walking stick, the heteropteryx a minute ago, this uh, exatosoma right here continues. We've still got these. We've had these for a really long time, you know, almost since, well, since the very beginning, actually, 34 years. Here's another one, one last walking stick to, to touch on from Peru. Okay, now this one's rather small. It's only, it's about as big as the native walking stick you see around here. The, about four inches long or so, but rather colorful. And this came from one of the collecting crypts that went to Peru. Uh, couldn't resist such a colorful walking stick. Uh, while the bright colors should, uh, you know, suggest something, you know, the warning coloration, there's something about this that you should know about or that you need to know about before you handle it too much. What it can do, it produces a fluid that not only smells bad, it uh, also tastes bad. I'm sure it tastes bad, it has to because uh, it's bad. It, it smells like rubber cement, okay, if you can imagine uh, a white substance coming from the prothorax up there, 
a white liquid that oozes from there and smells like rubber cement. So this one, okay, feeding on fern. Easy enough to provide that. Boston fern works just fine. You can raise this in a greenhouse continuously. So no problem raising these. Okay, a few other things. I guess I'm down to the last a couple of things here. Uh, any number of Katie dids. Uh, we've tried all kinds of things over the years. This is a, a rather nice one. It also came from Peru. Here the eggs take about nine months to hatch. So it took a little doing to get the overlapping generation thing going on, but, but this one also would feed on pyracantha. There's a, a newly hatched nymph down here uh, on this end. So that's the first instar nymph right there. That's an adult, uh, adult female right here, ovipositor. Okay, so a lot, of, a lot about leaf feeders there. I had, I had a few predators earlier, but uh, praying mattises. Well, we've, we've raised, so we've displayed all sorts of praying mattises over the years. This is one that uh, is still on display, I believe. Uh, kind of a leaf mimic thing, comes from Malaysia, if I recall. Uh, Darrow platys is the genus. Okay, and then into the non-insects. <coughs> well, we've had, uh, if, if you're at, at, at all involved in an entomology uh, situation, you're, you're bound to get phone calls. People call and ask about, I found this spider, I think it's a black widow. Or I found this spider, I think it's a brown recluse. And how, how concerned should I be? So we thought, okay, we gotta have a display that shows what a black widow looks like. Here's the female on the left, the male on the right. Same with the brown recluse. We got so many phone calls. Anybody, anytime somebody found a small brown spider, they thought it was a brown recluse and they wanted to know, are they in danger? This thing was in my house. Most of the time it's not. It's some other small brown spider. So we set up a display with brown recluse spiders in it. And of course, you'll look for that little fiddle-shaped marking on the top of the cephalothorax there. And if you look close enough, you'll see the three pairs of eyes at the front, but you really got to look closely for that, of course. At any rate, brown recluse. Don't want to be handling those, of course. Something that we sometimes do handle during a, an insect demo is a tarantula. Although generally we don't recommend it because some people are allergic to the hairs. Kind of irritating uh, to some people. Uh, can cause a rash on your skin. Um, but the tarantula big advantage with tarantulas is they live almost forever, so you don't have to be concerned about reproducing these, you know, 25 years or something on a tarantula. That's, they, they really live a long time. Well, the, the females, males nowhere near that long, but the females you know, live uh, quite a long time. Something else that uh, an insect <coughs> exhibit uh, you know, usually has uh, is African millipedes. Something big, easy to handle, lives a long time. Uh, easy to care for, and it makes just a nice uh, demonstration animal when you're talking to a group of kids. And you can contrast insects with non-insects by just look at how many legs this has. Scorp uh, centipedes, on the other hand, not so good for handling. <laughs> but they do live rather long, so that's a, a big advantage with them. Same with scorpions. Don't want to be handling these too much, but uh, live a long time. And uh, this is an African species, quite big, so it makes a very nice display. And uh, and so, in conclusion, okay, the last slide. <laughs> Every now and then, you know, what kept the job interesting is, you know, com coming to work and, you know, just doing something that I really enjoyed doing. That, that was a big part of it right there. It was that, like a hobby out of control. You just can't go wrong if you can get paid for doing your hobby, I guess, can you? But uh, every now and then, come to work, there'd be something that we totally didn't expect. Quite a surprise. And this was one of those complete surprises. Here's a tailless whip scorpion, ambly pigeon. We didn't know it was expecting babies, but take a look at what it's got on its back. First in star, newly emerged cluster of young uh, whip scorpions. And we took very good care of them and successfully raised them to the adult stage. So, uh, well, let's thank our guests. Okay. Sure.